Okay, everybody, we're going to start. Can everybody hear me at the back? We had some audio issues yesterday, so a thumbs up from the back. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Okay, today, a welcome, should I say, first of all. Today, we're going to look at uh, click-free application deployment with the magic of PowerShell and Chocolatey. Now, there's a lot to get in on this presentation today, so you might find me glossing over a few bits, things that you might think I should <laughs> dig into a little bit deeper. The code and all the slides are going to be available, so... Uh, by all means, download them and have a look for yourself. But also, you can catch me, either ask questions at the end or uh, catch me uh, at the coffee break. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do, because we have so much to pack in, if you do have any questions, could we really leave them to the end, maybe jot them down, and we can pick them up in that 15 minutes rather than during it so that I don't run over time. So in this session, what we're going to do is understand what chocolate is. We're going to understand the difference between packages and installers. Be able to create a package. We're going to create a kind of dummy package so that we uh, all know how to do that using the chocolatey template. Uh, we're going to learn how to work with installers that won't install silently. Believe it or not, not everything will work with command line switches. In this day and age, it's uh, difficult to believe, but yes, that is the case. So we've got a solution for that. Uh, learn how to use Pester to test your packages. Now, if you were at my talk yesterday, you'd have seen some of the Pester code. I've added a little couple of little uh, additional checks to it, but it's effectively the same sort of code. So, uh, who wasn't at the talk yesterday? So that's quite a lot. Okay, so we'll, we'll, you know, you'll get some benefit from that as well. From those of you that were uh, there yesterday, you'll be able to see the Pester again because it's just awesome. Uh, learn what the Chocolate Community Repository is all about. So today, the talk's not really focused on organizations as the one yesterday was. So we looked at internalizing packages and we're focusing on organizations. We're looking uh, primarily today at the Community Repository, the open source part, the community, and how you uh, create packages for yourself and to uh, submit to the Community Repository as well. And we're going to learn how to keep your package continually updated. I warn you about that last one. The actual process for doing that, the PowerShell module, a lot of people have said is, is very complicated and very difficult to understand. So we're going to kind of gloss over it a little bit. I'm going to give you an idea of how it works. And it's your homework to go away and kind of dig into that a bit deeper. That actual module and how it all works is probably a talk on its own. So as I said yesterday, and some of you will know, and Rob Sewell's still not here. So I can't uh, say anything more about that. But I usually put this up for two reasons. One, to annoy Rob, but as I said, he's not here. The other one, to let you know that I'm from Scotland and we talk very fast. And if I'm talking too fast today, please just let me know. Put your hand up and ask me to slow down because it's important that you get as much out of this talk as possible. Okay. Uh, this is also not a sales pitch. Um, I'm not here to sell anybody chocolate. Eat. So what this is going to be is a, a talk round about the free and open source version. Yesterday we talked about the commercial version. Today we're talking about the free and open source version. So the bit you can download from chocolate.org, we will actually be uh, looking at all of that today and you'll be able to use everything today with that. So what is chocolate? Um, slightly different slides from yesterday. So uh, you, those of you who were here yesterday, you'll get something new. But traditionally, Linux has had like apt, yum, pacman, and the other installers that it used on the Linux platform. And you would install your software uh, from the command line. So to install PowerShell, there's the commands to do so. On a Mac, you'd have the same sort of thing, slightly different command, but it's the same idea. You would install it all from the command line. Now, Windows has never really had that. We've always had to download the installers. You all know the pain, click next, 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 and you keep going until you're nearly finished, then you click finish. And then when you want to update it, you've got to do the same thing again. So Chocolatey was born from that. So Chocolatey is a package manager for Windows in the same sense that Apt and Yum and Pac-Man is for Linux and Homebrew is for Macs. It was created by Rob Reynolds in uh, March 2011. That's when the first version was released. So it's not a flash in the pan. It's not something that's just appeared overnight. We've been around now for uh, over eight years. Uh, some of you may wrote Rob, um, there's his handle there, uh, at Fervent Coders, his Twitter handle, but he uses that in Slack, etc. as well. So some of you will already know, uh, know Rob. So to install PowerShell uh, Core from uh, Windows, now you do choco install PowerShell dash core dash Y. And there it is. All silently installed for you, and to upgrade it, you just use replace install with upgrade. And off it goes. So one of the fundamental tenets of chocolatey, or tenets, I keep saying tenets, is that Chocolatey manages packages and packages manage installers. So the example I normally use is Google Chrome. So Chocolatey will manage the Google Chrome package and the Google Chrome package will manage the Google Chrome installer. Chocolatey does not manage installers. So Chocolatey will not manage the Google Chrome installer. Okay, that's the package's responsibility. 
And it's Chocolatey's responsibility to manage the package. That may seem very straightforward, but it's quite important to know that, especially when you're maybe troubleshooting an issue. For example, someone may come along and say, Chocolatey's not installing Google Chrome. Well, Chocolatey does install Google Chrome, so that's, that's the reason for that. Chocolatey, uh, the Google Chrome package installs Google Chrome. So it gives you an idea of where you can look for the issue if you have any problems. Now, we do support very early versions, Windows 7, 2003. That's kind of where it was born, PowerShell 2, .NET 4. Um, so we support all of that all the way back. Um, there are some packages that obviously need uh, newer versions of PowerShell, for example. But the, them aside, um, all of the packages you'll find on a Chocolate Community Repository will support PowerShell 2 and uh, .NET 4. Some functionality requires .NET 4.5. Um, things like TLS 1.2, if you're downloading anything from GitHub, for example, uh, that uh, those protocols are not in .NET 4, so we need .NET 4.5 for that. But by and large, .NET 4 is, is the kind of minimum requirement. But we don't support Nano. And uh, that could be a sad face or not, depending on how you feel about Nano. But there is a GitHub issue for that, and you can add any feedback or comments around about that if you want to. If anybody wants to take a screenshot of that just now, uh, sorry, a picture of that just now, um, to get that GitHub number, they can do. No cameras going up, that's fine. So what is a chocolatey package? The chocolatey package is effectively just a zip file. It's a fancy zip file, nothing more than that. Um, so you can open it with 7-zip, uh, um, WinZip, all these kind of zip uh, managers. You can actually open the file with that. It contains some special folders. We'll see them later on. We don't need to care about them. That's up to uh, the actual package for a uh, specification that needs to worry about that. But we commonly call it a NUPKEG or a new package is actually the, the proper name for it. And that's based on the extension of the, the package itself, which is NUPKG. So NUPKEG, new package, that's, that's what it is. But it contains metadata, PowerShell scripts, and sometimes other files. So the files you can see on the right-hand side, we've got package name.newspec. That's a metadata file. Now, it will be called after whatever your package is. So if it's Google Chrome, it will be Google Chrome.newspec. But um, it contains metadata, such as the ID, the version, description, various other information, um, to let the, the you and the package uh, manager chocolate itself to know you know what's in that, that package. It contains the PowerShell scripts as well. There was one of them on the right-hand side there, chocolateinstall.ps1. And uh, I'll go through the actual PowerShell files a bit later on. But it can contain other files as well. We've got an installer.msi there. You could add configuration files, certificates, other PowerShell scripts. Whatever it is you want to add that, that you need for your particular package, you can add in there. Um, Chocolate only cares about the files it cares about, and uh, the, the specification only cares about the, the files it cares about. Anything else, that's up to you to add in and, and work with as you need to. Um, it also builds on the NuGet package framework. Uh, we, we do use uh, version 2 NuGet feeds um, if you're setting up a repository within an organization. Um, at home, you're unlikely to be doing that. You're probably going to use a folder for your packages, if anything. Um, but it does work with other, other things that uh, will work with the version 2 NuGet specification. So Chocolatey does love PowerShell, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. Um, all of the scripts, the install, the uninstall, and the before modify, we can see at the right-hand side, are all just PowerShell scripts. Um, Chocolatey relies on PowerShell to do a lot of the management of the installer itself. Um, so anything effectively that you can do in PowerShell, uh, you can do within a Chocolatey package. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Um, but the, the files at right-hand side, I'll quickly go over. It's kind of obvious by their names. The install one does the installation of the software, as you'd expect, and the upgrade as well. The uninstall one uninstalls it. And the before modify one runs before upgrade and, uh, sorry, before the install script on an upgrade and before the uninstall script on an uninstall. And that's primarily there to maybe stop services, uh, kill processes and remove lock files, that kind of thing. But I did say you can almost do anything. Uh, within a, a chocolatey package. There's one thing you can't do, and if anybody knows anything about the IT crowd, you'll know that you're actually not supposed to type Google into Google because bad things goes and happens. Um, it's the same with uh, chocolatey. Don't use the choco command within your uh, PowerShell scripts itself, uh, your install, your uninstall. That's, that's just going to cause problems at the end of the day. I was expecting more of a laugh from that than I got, but never mind. So uh, let's look at chocolatey packages themselves. That took me an age to put together. That's just <laughs> absolutely gutted. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Choco new command. And what that does is it um, creates a, a template package for us uh, using the name that we're going to give it on the screen there, which is my package. Does everybody see that okay? Is that big enough for everybody at the back? Yeah, cool. Thank you. So it's created all these files here, and we're going to see them in the file system rather than looking at it here there. But um, you can see that Choco New creates a new template package for you. If you're new to packaging, that's a really good place to start, as there's a huge amount of information, as we're going to see in a second. <clears throat> so it creates all of these files here. It creates this tools folder, and it puts in the three uh, PowerShell script files I uh, talked about earlier, and it puts in these other two text files. I'm going to go through them all um, kind of briefly. The one I would always start with is the README one. And there's a huge amount of information in there uh, about creating packages. Um, again, I'm going to, you know, you run Choco New, you'll get all this information. I'm just really giving you an idea of, of what's uh, available. We've got links to documentation on chocolatey.org, things about automatically updating your packages, shim generation. You know, we could go through this all day. Um, there's variables in there, and there's chocolatey helper functions. Really, really uh, useful if you have never created a chocolatey package before. Now, the other one that I find incredibly useful as well is the to-do file. Now, what that does is it gives you step-by-step step to go through and how you would determine how you're going to create your package, what things you want to put in there, depending on, on where it's to be uh, used, for example. So the very first one is determine package use. So you're going to use this internally within an organization up here. Um, are you going to use it in the community repository? Do you have distribution rights? Do you not have distribution rights? Um, determine the type of package. You know, on and on, then chocolate install PS1 file. Again, so you would go through that step by step. Make sure you've got all the information you need in order to submit it to a community repository. Or if you're using it within an organization, it's quite useful for that as well, because you can see again what steps you need to go through. And we've got files within the tools folder. Now, traditionally, the structure that, that um, Chocolate has created there is what most people use. You don't have to use it. You use what, you're, what you want. Um, it will find uh, these uh, install and install scripts elsewhere. If they're in the root, for example, it'll find them there as well. But traditionally, we keep it this way because it's familiar to everybody. Um, I'll go to the license file, and we'll go into the, the scripts in just a second. License file is if you're embedding software and you want to uh, submit it to a chocolate community repository. What you would do is copy the license for the software in there. That allows us as moderators uh, to see that the license provides distribution rights. Um, and you also put the where you found the license as well, so that we can check it actually does ap apply to that particular bit of software. So all you're doing there is you're helping us. The verification.txt file, um, that's basically a set of instructions on how we can verify the checksum of the installer. Um, so you, we want to make sure that the installer, wherever it's downloaded from, originally, because you're embedding it in the, the software, that's why uh, in the package, which is why you need this file. But you would download it from somewhere. We want to check that that one you downloaded is the same one you've embedded, so the checksums will match. So that gives us uh, instructions, just step by step. Download it from here. Checksum should be this. That, that's all we need. So again, that's helping the moderators confirm that the, the installer inside the package is what it should be. And then we've got the chocolate install. And I'm not going to go over the other two, uh, have a look at the other two, because they're effectively the same as this. They are full of comments um, that before you actually submit to the community repository, you should uh, remove. But again, what they do is they take you through step by step of why things are there, what you should be putting in there. Check some values, what you should really use is a SHA-256. Some uh, example silent switches you might want to use, depending on the installer of the, uh, the software that you're embedding. Or downloading. Valid exit codes. Some software don't uh, exit with uh, exit code zero when they've been successful. They exit code with someone else. You can add that in there to say that's a successful exit code. Um, so again, that goes through all of that. But one of the really uh, important ones for, for me, and I'm always checking this, is this helpers. It gives you the location to that because there's different chocolatey helper functions that you can use. This one's install dash chocolatey package. You've got install dash install chocolatey package. You've got uh, ones for zip files. You know, so there's, there's lots and lots there. So that one might not be suitable for what you're doing, but you can look at the others. Now, the only one it doesn't fill anything in, I said I wasn't going to look at it, but we'll just click it anyway, is that one. And it's effectively empty because you need to fill that in with what you're going to stop the processes or services, etc. what you're going to do. So that's that script I mentioned earlier that does that. Um, the install one is exactly the same as install, different code, but full of comments, uh, just the same. So 
So I mentioned the three PowerShell scripts. I hope this is big enough for everybody to see. Um, but there's three PowerShell scripts that I mentioned, the chocolate before modify, the install and the uninstall. It's important to know what these uh, scripts actually do. Um, so the, here we've got a, a sort of table of when they're run. Uh, the chocolate before modify is run, the very first script it's run, and upgrade and uninstall. Assuming it's there, you might not need it. If you don't need it, you don't put it in. Chocolate install will run, obviously, in the install and the upgrade, and the uninstall on the uninstall only. Okay. So that's handy when you're trying to work out what runs where. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a dummy package. Just got to the top here. So the four things that um, a package must have uh, inside the new spec, metadata wise, is an ID, which Chocolate has kindly filled in for us, my package. It needs a version, which it's telling you to replace here. So I'm just going to call it 1.0.0. It needs an authors. So I'll just put in Bobby. And it needs a description, which I'm just going to leave as is. But there's a bit down here that's important as well. There's a files section in the, the XML. And what that's telling us is anything inside the tools folder, put it inside the chocolatey package. If you don't have that file section, it will include everything that's in that folder and subfolders. So in the case of that's been missing, it will include the todo.txt, the readme, the license.txt verification, everything in tools as well. So everything will be in there. But all we're saying is include, just include the tools folder, which will include the three scripts and the two text files. So we just package that up. And we'll have a look at it in 7-zip. As I said, uh, chocolate packages are just zip files. So that's a new spec file. Hopefully you can again see that at the back. Um, that's the new spec file that we created. As you can see, it's removed all the comments because they're not needed. My package, version one, blah, 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 all the other information that's in there. Okay. And it's also included everything that was inside that tools folder. But you'll notice that it hasn't included the todo.txt that's over here and the readme because we had that file section. Okay. Just to repeat again, if you don't have that, it will include them in there. Now the tools, um, the chocolate install.ps1, we need to modify to make it work. We're not going to do that here. There's a reason we'll find later on. We're just going to use the default template, which won't install anything because it's full of dummy information and bits and pieces that are missing that you're supposed to provide it with. But that shows you how easy it is to create a package. A very, very simple package, uh, granted, but it's, that's how easy it is to create a package. So we're going to have a look at an existing package, which is always a good place to look when you are uh, creating your own packages. Go on to the Chocolate Community Repository, download some packages and see how other people are doing it. Especially packages similar to what, what you're doing. You'll probably find that if you've hit any problems, they might have hit them as well, and they'll have overcome them with some PowerShell. <clears throat> so this is the putty package. Now, this is a different type of package. I'm not going to go through all the different types, so please don't roll your eyes. Um, this is a, what's called a meta package. Okay, so it's, it's effectively putty. If you install this, uh, the important bit for us that we're looking at is the dependencies. So it's important to understand dependencies when you're creating your own packages, particularly if you're creating, uh, sorry, packaging software that requires things like .NET. So there's a .NET version that, um, that requires on the machine, required on the machine to run. So you need to put that um, into the package as a dependency. You don't put .NET inside the package. You put that as a separate package. And you'll find that that will probably be on the Chocolate Community Repository. Well, it is the various .NET versions, but whatever it is that you're looking for. And the reason for that is you might have another bit of software that requires that as well, and another bit. So you, if you have a separate package for it, you're only ever packaging it once, not three times inside three different packages. So this dependency here tells us we need putty.portable, and it also gives us a version. Uh, in this case, you can see the version number there. So we're actually going to go and have a look at that package, because that's the one that does things. This package doesn't have a tools folder, as you can see. It doesn't have any of the chocolatey scripts that are required. So effectively, this package doesn't do anything with PowerShell. What it does is it tells chocolatey, I need that as a dependency and nothing else. So when chocolatey comes along to install putty, it will look inside the new spec file, it will look at the dependencies. It will see it needs putty.portable. It will install that first. 
it will then go back to the putty package here and it will say, right, what else do I need to do? And this package has nothing else, so that's all it does, and that's it, fine. In the case of your application, it might need .NET. After it's installed .NET, it may then go and do other things like install your application, etc. Okay? So it's important to understand that. So we're going to have a look at the putty dot portable package. New spec file is not really important, but what I'm going to show you is that it has no dependencies. Okay, it's just the metadata. But what it does have in the tools folder, it has the two zip files there that you see, which is actually the software uh, zipped up, and it has the chocolatey installed.ps1 file. And all that's telling it to do is run get chocolatey unzip with these arguments up here, the, the splatted arguments. And that's telling it to unzip either the X32 or X64 zip file. Chocolatey will know what version, uh, what bitness your operating system is. So if you're running on a 64-bit operating system, in this case, it will install the X64. If you're running on 32-bit, it will install the X32 one. Okay. And you'll see also that this package has a license.txt file. Because this is old software, they haven't put the location for the license in. Or should I should have said an old package, not software. And uh, yeah, so we've got the, the license here that's copied in, so that helps us as moderators. And then you've got the step-by-steps for the uh, for the verification.txt and how we would go about verifying that, that those putty.zip uh, files that are inside the package are actually the ones that are downloaded from the putty website. But these are also handy for user, a user. If you download this package, you want to install it, you can check that as well yourself if you really want to. Now, if you were at the talk yesterday, you'll hear me talking about Oracle um, and the sort of internalization process that we have to go through uh, with Oracle, i.e. it doesn't work. Um, and the reason for that is Oracle makes us jump through a lot of hoops in order to download things um, from the command line rather than through your browser. Um, so I'm going to show you here the, an example of the GRE8 uh, package. I'm just going to have a look at the install file. So we had the one previously, we had well, a dozen lines of PowerShell, and a lot of that was just setting up variables. In this one, you'll find that there's a substantially more lines of code. So there's 130 lines of code in here in order to install Java, and a lot of that's to do with downloading Java um, and checking if Java's installed and what the hoops it has to jump through to get it. But the important thing for us to look at is not really the code, but the fact that we can do fancy stuff within uh, chocolatey packages with the PowerShell. So we don't have to use those 12 lines of code, and that's us. You know, we can do other stuff. You're uninstalling the, is this JRE installed as, as one of those scripts that are uh, needed um, for this package? So that's bundled in there as well. As I said, you can have other files within your package. <clears throat> so we've got also badly behaved installers. I mentioned that to you before. Uh, VeraCrypt's a good example of this. Um, does anybody, or does everybody know what auto hotkey is? Please put your hand up if you don't. If you don't, okay. Okay. Auto hotkey uh, basically mimics uh, mouse clicks and keystrokes. Um, so if you're, uh, for an installer's point of view, where you would click next, 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 you can sometimes hit Alt N, for example. So it would then mimic those keystrokes. Okay, so that you can, inst in this case, when we're using it for, automate the installer. So traditionally, if um, I'm double-clicking on VeraCrypt, this is what would happen. It's going to take just a little bit of time. So it gives me a chance to have a drink. So you probably can't see all that at the way at the back. It's not the, the actual stuff is not important. The point is that I'm going to have to click on OK, tick the license agreement, click Next, Next. And I maybe want to uncheck some of these and change that as well, and then I click install, which I'm not going to do. The way Chocolatey works with the community repository, um, as an organization, if you were using VeraCrypt, you'd probably repackage this with MSI Repackager um, or something else. Uh, AutoHotkey is, is what a large number of packages on the Chocolate community repository uh, use to automate this process. So I'm going to just show you that now. Again, this will take a little bit of time, but it, if you blink, you might miss it. You'll see the screens pop up as AutoHotkey clicks all the buttons. It's got to install AutoHotkey Portable, as you can see at the bottom there. That's another dependency for this package.
that you see it now go. So that's not an ideal way of doing it. Uh, we would hope things would be silent, but it's not a very bit of software can install silently. So that's, that's what's used in the chocolate community repository. Again, just to reiterate, in an organization, you'll probably repackage all this and do stuff your own way. There's another uh, bit of software called Auto IT, which I've seen some people use as well, very similar to Auto Hotkey. Um, so it's just in case you come across that as well. But if we go and uninstall VeraCrypt, Again, you'll see the boxes pop up because it's not even a silent uninstall. There you go, that's it, uninstalled. So that gives you a, a way of doing that um, if you come across a badly behaved installer. And we can have a quick look at the actual um, chocolate installed.ps1. And you'll see it's very similar to the ones we looked at earlier. It's got all of this, which is very similar, but it's got this little bit here as well, which what it does is it runs auto, key, auto hotkey in the background with a particular script, and it'll sit there and wait for the windows to appear and click the buttons. So that's the only real difference with this. The uninstall is, is effectively the same way, same idea. Um, and I'm going to very quickly show you this. This is the auto hotkey script. The language for auto hotkey is kind of convoluted. It's, it's quite archaic. Um, but it does work, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into that in any more detail. You can dig into that, but that's the code there for that auto hot key script that runs and clicks all those buttons and uh, presses the keystrokes. So we'll jump back to the slides for a little bit. So the chocolate community repository. We don't uh, talk about this too much, not because it's a secret, but it's mainly because people just generally don't ask. They'll ask about specific um, areas of it, but not the kind of process as a whole. So that's what I'm going to try and look at is the whole process. And then we've got another couple of demos, and then we'll be done, I promise. Uh, repositories at chocolatey.org, and it's hosted by Chocolatey themselves. If you're looking for the packages and you want to see a web view of that, it's chocolatey.org slash packages, and they're all available on there. And when you install uh, the free and open source version, um, or in fact any version of Chocolatey, uh, the, choco, the Chocolatey package source comes installed by default, and that points to the Chocolatey community repository. So at the box you can do something. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to add anything. You can start installing packages right away. And the vast majority of packages are created by volunteer maintainers. Before I started at Chocolatey, I, uh, I've, I created packages myself, so that was done in my spare time, because that was things I wanted to use. Um, so the vast majority of people are, uh, who create packages and maintain packages are the same as me, they're just volunteers. And I still have a large number of packages on uh, the Chocolatey website as well. Um, some vendors maintain their own packages. We're really, really keen for vendors to uh, obviously maintain their own packages because they've, they're the ones that have the most vested interest in there. They can also embed them if they really want to, circumvent their own license, which is ideal. Um, the repository as well is for the many and not the few, so the use of it is actually monitored. I talked about this in more detail yesterday, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the mechanisms we used for monitoring it, um, or for blocking, should I say. We'll come to that in a second. But licensing is important as well. Um, because it's a public resource, we don't have distribution rights. So if you want to embed software in there, as we talked about with the license.txt file in the package, um, you need to provide that license, and that license says you can distribute this software. So a lot of public software is allowed to be distributed, so it's not an issue. But things like Google Chrome, we can't embed that inside there. Google would uh, understandably be annoyed by that, so we have no distribution rights. Um, so that's important to understand. You can't just put any software you want inside a package. Um, mainly it's downloaded at runtime when the package um, it starts executing the PowerShell scripts. So the Chocolatey Community Repository, I kept saying yesterday about 6,500 packages, and I checked again this morning, and we're at nearly 6,900 packages, with nearly 70,000 uh, versions of those packages in total. There's 548 million installs of Chocolatey packages um, since the website appeared, and we've got 5,056 uh, known good packages. I'm not reading these numbers out for the, the sheer hell of it. There is a reason. The 5,056, you can see it's different from the 6,856 unique packages. Some of those packages are, were uh, made available on the Chocolate Community Repository before moderation was a thing. 
Okay, and those packages have not been updated since then, so they might not work. They might be out of date, um, but you know they're still on there, and, and maintainers can come along. Any of you can come along and go. I actually use that software. I want to actually now maintain that software, and you can pick those packages up by just letting us know, um, and, and you know working with them. The, the stats I'm not going to go through, but as you can see, there's, there's a you know it's it's a heavily used website. So the excessive community repository use, as I said, this isn't a talk really about organizations, but this particular bit you should know about, and it kind of applies mainly to organizations because they're the ones that hit these limits most. We implemented rate limiting in October, November last year um, to improve the stability of the website because, um, as we said, the website is for the many, not for the few. Um, so if you hit any of these limits, if you have downloads of the chocolate package, more than five of those per minute, or downloads of any other package, 20 uh, per minute, you will be blocked for an hour. And after that hour, the block is lifted. And, you know, if you hit the limit again, it's blocked. And as you can, you know, if you're using this at home and you're installing a few packages here and there, you're not going to be hitting these limits. So it doesn't apply to the vast majority of us in here. It'll apply to organisations. And if you're doing it at that particular level, then again, you know, you, you're excessively using the route with the website. Chocolate.org is a free resource um, for everybody to use. Monthly download monitoring as well is, is a, a thing. Um, that's been in place for some time, and that's actually a fixed block. If you uh, hit the, there's a specific limit, which we don't disclose, but it's tens of thousands of packages per month. If you're hitting that limit, then you will tend to be an organization, and once again, you'll be excessively using the community repository. Okay, and that, again, websites for the many, not the few, and we block that permanently until you come and contact us. Whoever the IP address belongs to, they'll come along, they'll contact us, say, I'm blocked, and then we can discuss how we mitigate that in the future. We talk about internalization and repositories and those kind of things to encourage them to use the website responsibly. The, the, the bit I said where we don't normally talk about, and it's not a secret, this is the bit here we don't normally talk about, and this is actually the submission process for the chocolate, uh, chocolate community repository. <clears throat> And I'm going to go through it, you know, kind of briefly. Um, but if you push a package to the Chocolate Community Repository, you'll get an email saying your package is pushed. It's going to be subject to um, these moderation reviews, package validator, verifier, and potentially a human moderator. So once it's received, it's actually sent to our package validator system, and it checks the new spec file. Okay, checks all that metadata in there, makes sure it's all good, and it meets the rules for the Chocolate Community Repository. Then it's sent on to the package verifier and scanner at the same time. The verifier will actually install and uninstall your package and make sure it does install and uninstall properly. The scanner will install your package, take all the files from that installation, upload them to VirusTotal, and make sure that they, are, they don't contain malware. And then it's after uh, the verifier passes, I st actually I'll go back and say it, if the verifier doesn't pass, you're sent an email asking you to fix your package. Um, if, when it does pass, uh, it goes to a human moderator, and we will actually check it, sanity check it. So we'll check your PowerShell code might install and uninstall properly, but it might be doing all sorts of weird stuff. Um, we try and keep things to a sanity level that most people would, would adhere to. Um, so we would check that. We'll also check things like make sure the license file, the uh, license.url uh, that you put in your metadata, which points to the license for that software. We make sure that's valid, for example. Something that the package validator couldn't do. It can only check it that the URL is valid. Can't go in and check if the license is valid. So that's why uh, we do that as human moderators. And once that all passes, once we pass that package and approve it, um, it will then appear on the website for everybody to use. Um, but it also goes through a monthly package verifier as well. And what happens every 30 days is it just gets passed back to the verifier to make sure it still uninstalls and uninstalls correctly. The reason for that is um, a lot of packages will use uh, the installer, download the installer for somewhere on the web. That, that location could disappear. Um, it, a new version could come out. Um, so that file is no longer available. So there's different things that can happen to your package over a month. So that's why um, it's validated after 30 days again. Just to touch on organizational community use, um, it's not we don't um, recommend you use the chocolate community repository directly if you're an organization. Uh, you can use it for your package internalizer. That's awesome because you're just pulling it down once. But we don't recommend you directly use it. Um, we also recommend you create a package repository so you can internalize uh, your packages within your organization using Artifactory, Nexus, or ProGet. We've also got things like virtual caches uh, where all your uh, nodes can go out through effectively a proxy. Um, and it will 
once the, it hits that proxy, that proxy will download from a chocolate community repository once, and it'll cache that package. When your second node comes along and goes through the proxy, the proxy can see that it has that software already downloaded, and we'll just do it internally. That's not something Chocolatey provide, but Artifactory, Nexus, and Proget provide those options. They're called different things, but effectively they're, uh, they're virtual repositories. Okay, so you don't always have to go and start having a massive uh, package repository within your organisation. That is another option. In order that you disable the Chocolatey Community Repository, you can use those two commands there: Choco Source Disable with the Chocolatey and Chocolatey Dot License source names. So we're going to look at testing your packages and keeping them updated. I'm also conscious of time. So as I mentioned earlier on, we did some pester tests yesterday in the talk, and these are effectively the same with a few, a few changes. Um, but we're going to have a look at the package tests first of all. There we go. Let me get rid of that and put that over there. There we go. Okay. So we just, this uh, pester script, a uh, pester test script, uh, just needs a name of a package in the path, wherever you've put it. Um, and what it will then do is it will check that the uh, package itself is valid, is a valid zip file. Because as I said earlier on, a new package, a chocolate package is just effectively a zip file. So all we do is we extract it. If there's no problems with it, then it's, it's a valid zip file. We also just check it contains one new spec file. And then we're going to uh, test, sorry, yeah, we check it's also a valid new spec file. Uh, new spec, as I mentioned earlier, is just XML. So we just check we can, uh, you know, open it and read it as XML. We're going to test some, test some of the package uh, new spec files as well, or NUPSEC as I've put there because I can't spell. Oh, that's even worse. There we go. Um, yeah, we're just going to test two of the fields. We're going to test that the ID is less than 25 characters. That's kind of a chocolatey community repository rule. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a rule we've added in here. Um, and what we're also going to do is just check one of the fields that contains a URL, and that's one called project URL. And that tends to be points to the, uh, the project for the, the software that you've uh, embedded or that you're using with your package. So for Google Chrome, you point to the Google Chrome website. That's all the project URL would contain. So we're just going to check that that actually is valid and returns you know, a 200 code um, rather than a 404 or something else. And then what we're going to do is we're going to install it on a virtual machine I've got running on here, and we're going to uninstall it and just make, it, make sure it installs and uninstalls. So that's all of our tests that we're going to run. And we're going to run them against two packages. We're going to run it against the, the My Package, the one we created early on, the Dummy Package. Now that is going to fail, um, but I want to show you uh, the tests actually running and failing. See, it's failed already. It's too quick for me. There you go. The reason it's failed there is because the project URL I left is the, the default information, which says software location remover fill out. It's not valid URL, so it's going to fail that. And it's also going to fail the install and uninstall, because as I mentioned at the beginning, the install script and the uninstall script has dummy information, missing information that we needed to fill in that we didn't do so. So it's not going to install properly, and it's not going to uninstall properly either. So we're going to run the same test. We're going to use it on Putty Portable. If you remember, kind of back at the beginning, we looked at the putty.portable package that we uh, downloaded. So we're going to run the same tests on that. So that passes the project URL because it's valid. This is when speakers start panicking. Ah, there we go. Uh, it's, it's installed the package without a problem. And it's uninstalled without a problem. So that's, as I said, that just, I've got another VM running here and it just goes away and installs it and uninstalls it, makes sure it works. So that's, that gives you a very brief overview of how you can use Pester to test your packages. Okay, just bear in mind that your new spec file is just XML. That's all it is. And your uh, PowerShell scripts are just PowerShell. So you, if you can, you can work with them, manipulate them, you could go and check if PowerShell is valid. There's all sorts of tests that you could write um, to make sure that your package is, it meets your requirements, your standards. Now, I also mentioned that um, AU, um, that, you know, keeping your packages automatically updated, should I say. The, the module, the PowerShell module for that is called AU. Um, I mentioned that it was kind of uh, difficult for a lot of people to use. 
Um, and a lot of people find that um, it can be problematic uh, for them to sort of pick it up and be able to use it, especially if they're new to packaging. Um, so there's actually a page on the Chocolatey Community uh, website about it. The thing to bear in mind is AU is not written by or, or uh, maintained by the Chocolatey team or Chocolatey themselves. Okay, It's written by a third party. Um, who uh, actually is one of the maintainers on our core uh, packages repository. And I don't want to repeat his name because I'll do it an injustice, so I'm just going to highlight it there. Okay, so that's who's written it. Um, and as I said, it's Pershaw version 5, and it's called the AMU module. And you can find all the information about it on the chocolatey, uh, uh, sorry, the chocolatey website documentation, and it points to the various places. But the important thing that I'm going to go through is um, I'm going to take you through two of the automatic update PowerShell files that I use for two packages I maintain. The first one is DBA Tools. So we're just going to have a look at that one. And we've downloaded that. Uh, and it's in there. And there it's there. Wait a second to make everything... Nice and shiny. There we go. Um, so this is the kind of uh, update script that the uh, AU expects. Okay, um, it uses global functions. It's really designed to run through a CI system. It's not really designed to be run on your desktop. It can be, but it doesn't really uh, work for. In my instance, excuse me, uh, because it uses aliases all over the place, and uh, we all know that best practices don't use aliases in modules. Modules, but this does, and it causes problems with my system because I've replaced the LS alias with something else. It still does LS, but it doesn't colors, but it doesn't provide the output that this module expects, so it doesn't work. So as I said, it's, it's mainly designed for CI systems. Uh, but the important bit down the bottom here is the get latest function that you would uh, put together. And what that does is it gets the latest version. All it's going to return is a version. Um, in this case, we can add other information into it, but it's looking for a version and potentially a URL of the software if it's on the internet somewhere. If you're embedding the software inside the package, as I'm doing here, you don't need the URL. Um, so that version actually just goes away to uh, find the module from a PowerShell gallery, finds the correct version for it, and returns that version. EU itself will then determine whether the version is the same as the one that's already there, whether it's a new one. If it's a new one, it'll continue the process. Um, it will then run in this case, this before update function, as you can see here. And all this does effectively is download the module from PowerShell Gallery, zip it up, and return uh, some information uh, back to AU itself. And that's all it does. Once AU's finished that little bit of its job, it'll then package it up and push it to the Chocolate Community Repository. And then it'll go through all those processes we talked about earlier on um, to do with the, the validator, the verification, the scanner, etc. So that's a very simple automatic uh, update script, an EU script, um, for, uh, to, to run. Um, there's one slightly more complicated. We'll have a look at this one. And that's for Jenkins. I also maintain the Jenkins package. Again, the same functions are in there. Um, I left the, if you remember the other script, there was a lot of empty functions. I leave them in there to remind myself that those functions are there. Um, they, they're obviously empty, they don't do anything. It's just for me. Um, so what this one does is, again, is it runs get latest. Okay? And this one's slightly more complicated than that, it scrapes the website. So it'll go away and it downloads the, the web page, and it's looking for this reg regular expression. If anybody loves regular expressions, uh, you're obviously a masochist, but you'll understand what that does. And that will return the version. And again, that returns this case, the URL for that particular software, in case AU needs it. That will go back to AU. It will say, that version is a new version. I'm going to use the URL. And then I'm going to run this function here, which is search and replace. And all this really does is it looks at the file that you've given it, which in this case is chocolate install PS1. And it does these regular expression replacements. It's going to replace the URL, if you can see there, with the latest .url, which is what was down here, that URL there. Okay, so it's going to put that in there. So that's updated our chocolate install PS1 file for us. And it's going to add in the checksum, which it will create itself. And it'll add the checksum type, again, that it will create itself. So it does a lot of work for you in the background. And as I said, these will replace those uh, 
bits inside the chocolatey installed PS1. It'll also change the version number within the new spec itself it's, uh, when it updates because it's important that we've got a new version of a package. Well, we need a new version in the new spec that tells us that. <coughs> so that's the demos. That's us nearly done. We've got 19 seconds, but um, I'm sure we'll manage. So that's, that's testing your packages with Pester and the EU module as well. As I said, and I know I'm repeating myself, the EU module, you'd need to dig into that yourself. So I talk on its own, but it gives you something to work with, somewhere to start and kind of understand a little bit about how it works. So in summary for today, we know what Chocolatey is now, I hope. Uh, we know how to create packages and how to use the, the Choco new command to create you know, a package template. We've learned how to deal with the troublesome installers that don't work with command line switches. So we, we looked at VeraCrypt and we looked at AutoHotKey and I mentioned about AutoIT as well and uh, MSI repackaging. So these are all options. Uh, we've used Tester, uh, Pester sorry, to test our packages um, using those very, very simple tests that hopefully you'll be able to expand upon. We've learned what happens when you submit a package to the Chocolate Community Repository. Important if you're going to be working in the community to know how all this stuff works. And finally, we've, well, we've hopefully learned a little bit about how to keep our packages uh, up to date or continually up to date. So the slides in the demo code will all be uh, there. As there are any questions? Yes. Uh, the question is, can you pass parameters to a chocolate package? Yes, you can. There's two ways that you can do that. You can actually, pa if you want to pass it to the package itself and get the internal code to do something, then uh, you can do that. There's a switch that you provide to Chocolate to do that, as long as the PowerShell script that you or whoever else has written supports that. Um, you can also pass uh, switches through straight to the installer itself if it supports uh, switches. Uh, so yes, yes, you can do that. Anybody else? Yes. The, the, that is a good question. I don't think, because Chocolate actually includes its own PowerShell host, um, the, the, sorry, yeah, I'll repeat, I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Uh, the question was, um, what is the PowerShell, uh, what was the PowerShell execution, yeah, execution policy, that's what I was looking for, that uh, you have to put in place for Chocolate to work. Um, Chocolate includes its own PowerShell host. So to install Chocolate, if you go to the chocolate.org slash install, it actually does change the restriction, uh, the execution policy, sorry, um, just to install it. After that, it goes back to what it was. But chocolate includes its own PowerShell host, so that doesn't seem to make any difference. Anybody else? Uh, the, part of the question was, is there a common installation folder or is it the decision of the creator of the package? There's two answers to that, depending on the package type. Um, if you're using, again, I'll use the example of Google, Google Chrome, uh, that installer decides where it installs, so it'll generally be C program files, whatever it happens to be. Um, and uh, if, the, if you've got something like a portable package, um, the putty.portable we mentioned earlier on, then because that's just executable files, there's, you know, there's not an installer as such, it was a zip file containing executable files, the person who writes the uh, PowerShell script, uh, the chocolate install PS1 script, will decide where that goes. But there is, there is um, parameters or switches you can provide to Chocolatey, um, depending on the package type and depending on the version of Chocolatey they're using, to actually affect that. Yes? What channels are available for the open source and business edition? edition? Um, sorry? Live support channels? Like support channels? You, you mean things like Gitter, Slack, those kind of things. Uh, if you've got the commercial version of Chocolatey, then there's uh, commercial support available that comes with Chocolatey. Um, you, there's no extra paid for that. Um, you would go to chocolatey.org slash contact and you'll be able to get support that way. For what we're talking about today for the free and open source version, um, you can go into Gitter. Uh, Chocolatey does have a Gitter channel. I think it's gitter.im slash chocolatey. And there's a few... Uh, rooms in there, but the general one is Choco after that. Uh, you would get support for that. Um, you can contact, um, if you've got problems with a package that doesn't work. Chocolate don't support the packages on the community repository, the maintainers do. So you'd be able to go into the Chocolate community repository, go into the package page, and there's a contact maintainers button. 
uh, or link, should I say, on there, where you can contact the maintainer directly to say this is broken, uh, it's not installing properly, or, or whatever. Um, you can also contact the uh, site admins from that same page as well, saying maybe the maintainer's not responded, you know, there's an issue here, etc. Um, so there's, there's many different support options available for the, the free and open source version community-wise. Uh, we also have a Slack channels, uh, various Slack channels just now that we're starting to bring into play instead of Gitter. Um, so the, there are lots and lots of different options. Google Groups is another one I should really have mentioned. We have our Google Groups uh, for that as well, uh, Chocolate Google Group. Um, and off the top of my head, that's all the ones that I can remember. Do you know of any others that you're thinking about, or are you asking the question rather than knowing? Yeah, Twitter would be an option as well, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So there are lots, lots and lots of uh, avenues available. Any more questions? No? Okay. So if you like to talk, please push the button. And that's my video. <laughs> there are um, t-shirts and stickers if anybody wants them. I have a load of t-shirts. Please take them away. I don't want to take them home with me. <laughs>